But today, uh, we're going to be talking about genetics, evolution, and creation, most asked questions. And I think it's very important for people to be able to answer questions that others have about genetics. And that's not just because this is my opinion, because it's my area of specialty, but because it's a biblical command. So did you know that God commands us to be able to answer questions that people have about genetics? You're thinking, where is that? Well, it's actually in 1 Peter 3.15. But in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. You know, we live in a very scientific age. I mean, scientific news, it makes, the, it makes newspaper headlines. It makes the evening news, all of those things. And when it says, be prepared to give an answer to everyone, that includes people that are asking questions about genetics. You know, people are questioning the authority and the truthfulness of Scripture when it speaks on biology. And so we must provide answers that support the truthfulness of God's Word so that we can lead people to Christ. And it doesn't really require a PhD in genetics to do this, okay? Uh, that information is not in scripture. It doesn't say you have to have a PhD or be extremely well educated in these areas to be able to answer some of the basic questions that people have. So what we're going to do with each of these questions that we're going to address is we're going to look at a little bit of background on the issues. We're going to talk about the problems with the evolutionary thinking on these issues. And then we're going to talk about how we should be thinking about these issues as creationists. Now, we're going to get somewhat technical. And I figure you probably wouldn't be here if you didn't enjoy that to some extent. But one of the things that I provided for you at the very end of our discussion of each of these questions is a what can we say uh, summary slide to really help you with that. And you also have that information in your notes so that you can understand this information. If you can understand what's, what's being, what is written there, then you'll be able to discuss these issues intelligently with other people. So we are going to look at the five most asked questions. Now you might be thinking, wait a minute, there's six, okay? in the outline. Um, the outlines are due way before <laughs> the talk sometimes is actually formulated and, uh, and reviewed. And as I reviewed this, even as fast as I can speak, because you all know I have a reputation for that, uh, there's no way that I could get through all six of those and do that really well. So I'm not going to be sharing the information on the sixth question, which is on natural selection. If you want to find out more information about that, then you need to check out the Creation Museum. We have a brand new exhibit on natural selection, which I helped design. Um, you can take a look at that. You can also look in the New Answers Book 1. I wrote a chapter on natural selection, and there's plenty of things on our website that also discuss that issue. So be sure to check those out for any questions that you have on that. But let's look at the five most asked questions. These are the questions I receive in Answers in Genesis. Many other people have received, and keep hearing these, so we need to address these. Number one, does mitochondrial DNA evidence support the biblical time frame? Number two, does a human chromosome 2 fusion event support human chimp ancestry? Number three, do shared ancient repetitive elements, ARE, support common ancestry? And don't worry, we're going to define these things and I'll help you understand what they are. Because you might be thinking, what is that? Um, number four, does gene duplication add new genes with new functions to the genome? And number five, do beneficial mutations add information to the genome? So these are probably the five most asked questions that I receive and that others have received. And what I'm going to show you is that when we start with God's word as truth, we can rightfully understand what we observe today in the field of genetics and how it applies to what has happened in the past. And we'll see that it confirms the truthfulness of God's word. And that if we start with man's ideas as truth, there are a lot of problems and there are a lot of conflicts concerning what we observe today in the field of genetics and how it applies to the past. And we're going to see that it does not confirm man's ideas ideas as true. So that's what we're going to look at today. So the first question is this. Does human mitochondrial DNA evidence support the biblical time frame? So what are we talking about here? Well, let's talk about some facts. First of all, mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell. They're little tiny organelles inside our cells that produce energy. They're very important for that. They're inherited maternally. So we get those from our mother, um, not our father. Uh, it has a circular genome, which you see there, of about 16,000 base pairs. So they have their own genome. Now, genome basically means the entire sequence of DNA, the information in that. You have a nuclear genome, which is what most people are, are familiar with, but you also have a genome inside each of those mitochondria. And it encodes several genes, uh, which are important in what the mitochondria and what 
goes on there, as well as some regulatory, a regulatory region called the D-loop that controls those genes. So that's just some basic facts about the mitochondria itself. Now, how is this related to the issue of a biblical time frame? Well, for that, we have to go to the mitochondrial DNA clock, a molecular clock, and don't worry, we're going to talk about that, and mitochondrial Eve, which probably a lot of you are familiar with. So first of all, let's talk about what is a molecular clock. Well, basically, it relates the time that two species diverge to the number of differences between their DNA sequences. So, for example, the greater the time there is since two species diverge, the more differences you should see, because they've been on their own path for a longer period of time. But the lesser time since they've diverged, if this is a short time, there should be much more similar. There should be less differences. Now, something you need to know about molecular clocks, they are not an independent measurement of time. They are based on a certain assumptions about the past. They are calibrated according to certain things. The main things that they are calibrated with is that the basically assuming that the fossil record is accurate, radiometric dating is accurate, and that humans have diverged from chimps. Okay, so right away we can see there's going to be some major problems here with the assumptions they're using to sort of calibrate these clocks, to figure out how fast this molecular clock ticks, so to speak. So that's what a molecular clock is. Now, what, who, or what is mitochondrial E? Mitochondrial Eve is the maternal most recent common ancestor for all living humans. And she is believed to have lived around 100,000 to 200,000 years ago, uh, based on the fossil record, um, radiometric dating, things like that. So basically, we all have her mitochondria. Now, this is in no way reference to the biblical Eve. The evolutionists, for one minute, do not believe there was one woman, and we all have her mitochondria, but rather that one woman from a larger population of women, for whatever reason, it's her mitochondria that we all have today. And so we want to make that clear. Now, how do these thing, two things relate? Mitochondrial DNA clock and mitochondrial Eve? Well, a man by the name of Parsons, a scientist back in 1997, published a paper where he looked at the control region, that regulatory region, of mitochondrial DNA as a molecular clock. So he was going to use that to study some um, relationships. And what he expected to find was that there would be one mutation every 12,000 years. That's what he expected to find. Why did he expect to find that? Because based on the fossil record, based on radiometric dating, all of those things that humans diverge from chimps, that's what they had already assumed the rate would be. But they found something very different. Now, what he was looking at was modern human DNA. Mothers, daughters, grandmothers, granddaughters looked at 327 different generational events and found that actually the mutation rate is much, much quicker. It's, only, it's one mutation every 800 years. Okay? That's orders of magnitude faster than what they ever expected. Now, that in and of itself isn't so much of a problem, but it is a huge problem for them when you apply it to human evolution. Because the problem is that mitochondrial Eve becomes 6,000 years old, not 100 to 200,000 years old. Now, why are they saying that? Okay, because here's the thing. Mitochondrial D if the mitochondrial DNA mutation rate is really, really fast, but yet there's very few differences in human mitochondrial DNA today, Remember, less, less differences, right? Less time since we diverge. So, my, so mitochondrial Eve cannot be 100 to 200,000 years old. Instead, she's around 6,000. Now, everyone got really excited about that, right? A lot of creationists were really excited about that because, wow, that fits the biblical time frame. That's so cool. And I can understand that. Uh, I, you know, it seems to really support that. But what I didn't see a lot of, unfortunately, in the creationist responses was, what did the evolutionists think about this conundrum? Okay? What did they think? Was she really 6,000 years old? Not for one minute. Okay? In fact, one scientist commented, no one thinks that's the case. Okay? No one thinks that. Uh, there's no way. So they offered a solution to this obvious problem. They said, well, you know what? This fast rate that we're seeing, it's really accurate for the present, but it was really slow in the past. Okay. That's called a rescuing device. Dr. Lyle is going to be talking to you about that a little bit um, over the time that we have here. And what you're going to see is, basically, that's not based on the evidence. They don't know that. Okay? They're just using that to make their ideas work, okay? to make the data fit their starting points and their presupposition. And so that's fine, but again, it's not based on any evidence. They're just trying to make it all fit. In fact, one scientist who did some work 
on mitochondrial DNA and mutation rates, he said, we've been treating this like a stopwatch, and I'm concerned that it's as precise as a sundial. I don't mean to be inflammatory, but I'm concerned that we're pushing the system more than we should. And I would argue it's not even precise as a sundial. Okay? There's a lot of problems. So the question is, should we as creationists then use molecular clock data, which is becoming very, very popular, to support the biblical time frame for Eve? And the answer is no, because there are a lot of inherent problems with these clocks. And in fact, depending on how you calibrate the clock, okay, and depending on how you, um, what part of the DNA you look at, you get very different answers, very different answers. This is a table showing there's different answers. Depending on how you calibrate, depending on where you look at, you get anywhere from 6,500 years ago for Eve to 250,000 years ago for mitochondrial Eve, okay? And everything in between, right? There's no consensus, because it really depends. It's kind of like if you were to set your clocks at home, and you looked at this clock over, you looked at some clock over here, and it said it's 6.30, so you set your clock for 6.30, but then you realize the actual time is really 7.30. You know, another clock says that, so it really depends on what you're looking at, what answer you get, and what time you think it is. So that's why molecular clock data needs to be used very cautiously. We don't want to be accused of cherry-picking data to fit what we think. Okay? We don't want to do that. We don't need to do that. And Because there are a lot of problems with molecular clocks, because there are a lot of assumptions about those, about the unobservable path. They assume that evolutionary relationships and from the fossil record are accurate. They assume humans diverge from chimps. They assume that radiometric dating of fossil and rock layers is accurate. Now, we all know that's a major problem. And the calibration of molecular clocks kind of becomes like a circular argument. Um, they're using relationships and dates to determine rates of change, okay, how fast the clock ticks, and then they use the molecular clock to determine relationships and dates. So we've just done a complete circle. So that's a problem with it. And in fact, there was a paper published a few years ago, and I just love the title of this paper. Reading the Entrails of Chickens, Molecular Timescales of Evolution and the Illusion of Precision. I just, I love it, it's very catchy. And what did they say in this paper? Now this is by evolutionists, this is by secular scientists that totally still believe in evolution. They said that, in this article we document the manner in which a calibration point that is both inaccurate and inexact, and in many instances inapplicable and irrelevant, has been used to produce an exhaustive imagined evolutionary timeline that is enticing but totally imaginary. Now, what they, go, well, what they go on to say, and they still believe in evolution, um, what they go on to say is that there's been a lot of problems with how we identify fossils. There's been a lot of problems with the dating of the geological strata, things that, we've, that we point out a lot. So if the calibration is wrong, guess what? The clock's going to be wrong. The molecular clock's going to be wrong. And in fact, they showed this um, diagram in their, um, in their paper, and just to kind of, I know it's hard to read up from back there, but basically what they did was they used different calibration points that people know. Okay, no. And they said, okay, let's take those points and calibrate back and see when a non-photosynthetic bacteria like E. coli diverged from a photosynthetic bacteria. When did they diverge from one another? You know what the time frame they reached is? It happened five and a half billion years ago. What's the problem? The Earth is only four and a half billion years old. Okay. So it happened a billion years before the Earth existed. And so they said, you know, obviously that is a huge, huge, huge problem with it. And they go on to say this. Despite their allure, we must sadly conclude that all divergence estimates discussed here are without merit. Our advice to the reader is, whenever you see a time estimate in the evolutionary literature, demand uncertainty. <laughs> and, wow, there's a powerful quote coming from the evolutionists themselves. So there's a lot of, again, a lot of problems with these molecular clocks as we see, and many people will, will say that. Um, the mutation rate, you know, the fact that they're assuming the mutation rate is slow in the past but fast in the present, that's an assumption. Uh, that the mutation rate is the same in every organism. We know that's not true, but they're assuming that. They're assuming that the mutation rate is similar for all regions of DNA. We know that's not true based on the evidence. We know that. You know, they, we, are not, we weren't there to observe changes in DNA. No one was. And we, for the most part, don't have ancient DNA to compare modern in DNA too. So our assumptions about the past form the basis for molecular clock. They're basing their assumption on man's ideas about the past, which are in direct opposition to God's information about the past, as recorded in Scripture. So they're going to get incorrect conclusions about the past and about today as a result of that. 
So what can we say, though? Well, we know that the female ancestor of us all, the biblical Eve, lived very recently, um, a few thousand years ago. Why can we say this? Because of Scripture, okay? First and foremost, because that's what Scripture tells us, okay? We know that that's the time frame. But we also can know this from science. Um, there is a low level of variation found in human mitochondrial DNA from many different people groups. If you took everybody's mitochondrial DNA in here, I guarantee it would be highly similar, be very, very similar. And so because of that, that infers, again, if there's, if there's less differences, that means less time has passed between us and Eve. And a creation geneticist by the name of Dr. Robert Carter has actually looked at mitochondrial DNA in many, many different people groups, and he had this to say. The, gener the genetic facts, apart from the formulation of historical scenarios, are clear. There was a single dispersal of mankind with three main mitochondrial lineages interspersed within the clans. And you can read his paper for more information about that. This dispersal either passed through or originated within the Middle East. These things happened in the recent past, and the dispersion was essentially tribal in nature, with small groups pushing into previously uninhabited territory. Sounds like Tower of Babel, doesn't it? These facts are very consistent with the biblical scenario, so that what we're seeing, what the evidence, you know, how we're looking at this, and what we're observing is very consistent with a biblical scenario. So he published his findings in the uh, Proceedings of the Sixth International Conference on Creationism and presented those last year. And if you get online, you'll be able to um, order that and uh, get that article and, and see um, some of the really neat things that creation scientists and creation geneticists are doing, because we're addressing these issues and looking at them. Okay, so we know how to answer that question. We know how to deal with that. So what's next? Does a human chromosome 2 fusion event support human chimp ancestry? This is by far becoming the most asked question that I receive, so we need to deal with that. First of all, the facts. Humans have 46 chromosomes. That is a fact. Chimps have 48 chromosomes. That is also a fact. Banding patterns in DNA sequences on human chromosome 2 are very similar to what we find on chimp chromosomes 12 and 13. In fact, so much so, and because of people's evolutionary presupposition, um, they have renamed chimp chromosome 12 and 13 to 2A and 2B, okay, to reflect the fact that we supposedly diverged from them. And I, there's no doubt about it that the human and chimp uh, chromosomes are very, very similar to one another. In fact, if you look here, this is human, chimp, gorilla, and orangutan. And if you look at the human and chimp, this is human chromosome 2 and 12 and 13 for the chimp, you will see they're very, very similar in their banding pattern. If you look at the sequence, it's very, very similar. So I'm not no one can deny that, really. Now, some more facts on this. If you look at human chromosome 2 right in the middle of the chromosome, you will see a couple interesting things you'll see remnants of what are called centromeric DNA. Now, in the middle of a chromosome, you have a special kind of DNA called centromeric DNA. And human chromosome 2 not only has its one centromere, but it has remnants of another one. It looks like there might be another one there. And also in the middle, you have telomeric DNA. Now, that's interesting because telomeric DNA is only found on the ends of the chromosome. It's not found in the middle. But yet on human chromosome 2, you find some of that right in the middle. So what it looks like is that two chromosomes have come together and fused, at least um, superficially speaking. That's what it looks like. So in fact, human chromosome 2 may have resulted from the fusion of two chromosomes. And so many people love this. They think this is great because, you know, chimps have 48 and we have 46. So if you're going to evolve from a chimp, you got to lose chromosomes. you got to lose information. And so um, that they think is that chimp chromosome 12 and 13 fused to form human chromosome 2. And many evolutionists say that this is proof of common ancestry, absolute proof that we diverge from a chimp. In fact, Dr. Ken Miller, who is a well-known theistic evolutionist, recently had this to say. Is there any question to explain these facts? And these are facts. This is not hypothesis or conjecture, the fact that human chromosome 2 is similar to 12, uh, chimp chromosome 12 and 13. Any way to explain these facts in light of the view that our species was uniquely designed or intelligently created? The answer is no. You can only explain this by evolutionary common ancestry. Wow. That's a pretty powerful term to use only. Unfortunately, what Dr. Miller and many other evolutionists don't realize is they have committed a logical fallacy with their argument. So we're going to take a look at that, and we're going to point that out. And one of the biggest logical fallacies that I see committed, and you're going to see this several times today, is that of affirming the consequent. They say, well, if humans and chimps share a common ancestor, then we should observe a fusion event. 
Human chromosome 2 shows evidence of a fusion event. Therefore, humans and chimps share a common ancestor. OK, let me put this in other terms. If the grass is wet, then it must have rained. The grass is wet. Therefore, it must have rained. But the grass could be wet for any number of reasons, OK? It doesn't have to be rain, right? You can take your hose and spray the grass with it. It doesn't have to be rain. And the same thing is here. Just because human chromosome 2 may be the result of a fusion event doesn't mean that humans and chimps share a common ancestor. Okay? That's a logical fallacy. Casey Luskin, who is a member of the Intelligent Design Movement, I think really stated this well, referring to uh, Ken Miller's arguments on this. He said this, evidence for fusion in a human chromosome tells you little to nothing about whether humans share a common ancestor with living eight. The human chromosomal fusion argument focuses, focuses on a fusion event that is specific to the human line and therefore provides a highly limited form of evidence for human ape common ancestry. So he said, basically, even if humans diverge from chimps, okay, this happened once they were already on their own, okay? not back in the common ancestor, because again, chimps still have 48 and we have 46. So it happened somewhere after we diverge. Now, of course, from a biblical creationist standpoint, we would say there can be no evidence for shared ancestry ancestry because, again, God's word makes it clear that chimps and humans are in no way related. They were separate creation. So Luskin goes on to say, all Miller has done is documented direct empirical evidence of a chromosomal human event in the, a chromosomal fusion event in the human line. But evidence for a chromosomal fusion event is not evidence for when that took place, nor is it evidence for the ancestry prior to that event. It doesn't tell you when it happened. It doesn't tell you what was going on before it happened. And so Again, our historic, uh, it's very much historical origin science, so our presuppositions play a huge, huge role. What is our starting point? Man's ideas about the past or God's ideas about the past and what God's word says? It makes a big difference. And in fact, even those in the evolutionary community realize the problems with equating molecular similarity to evolutionary relationships that if we're really similar, well, we must have diverged from one another. And these next scientists I'm going to quote think orangutans are more closely related to humans than chimps. And they said this, Schwartz and Greerhan contend that the clear physical similarities between humans and orangutans have long been overshadowed by molecular analyses that link humans to chimpanzees, but that those molecular comparisons are often flawed. There is no theory, no theory holding that molecular similarity necessarily implies an evolutionary relationship, even though that's what you hear all the time. And molecular data that contradict the idea that genetic similarity denotes relation are often dismissed, which is plain out bad science. They're just going to dismiss it. If it doesn't fit their theory, it's gone. And so they're challenging that. They're saying, you know what? Just because they're molecularly similar doesn't mean that they have a common ancestor. doesn't mean that they have this evolutionary relationship. So even they themselves are questioning this. And there's other problems with this as well. If you're going from um, you know, chimps to humans, and we're supposedly more highly evolved, it, but this is involving a loss of information, okay? When you fuse two chromosomes, and it's obvious by looking at this, stuff is gone, okay? You've lost some of the centromere, and you've lost some of the telomeres. And those are very important. They're not junk, even though you see that a lot, and we'll talk about that a little more later. Um, some organisms have genes in their centromeres. Uh, telomeres are very important in regulating the production of, uh, from other genes. So they're very important. How, how do you get from one organism to another organism by losing information? You don't. It's a clear problem that we see over and over again. You need a game. And it's not a simple fusion. You know, a lot of people, I mean, I, had, I saw this one diagram where they literally showed, you know, the two chimp chromosomes coming together and boop, forming a fusion. Oh, wow, look at that. And to, you know, a lay person looking at that, they would probably think, wow, yeah, I can see that. This one was unfortunately used to teach children um, this, because this is what your kids are going to start seeing in their textbooks, and, and this is what they want, want teachers to teach. But it's not a simple fusion. There's a lot of non-alignments, gaps, and what we call translocations, pieces from other chromosomes. It's really mismatched. In fact, there's 150,000 base pairs that are in the human chromosome that aren't in the chimp chromosomes, okay? Huge parts are missing. It's not just a simple fusion, so don't be deceived by that, because that's what you see a lot out there on the internet. But what can, so what can we say about this? Okay, first of all, human chromosome 2 fusion event is not evidence for human chimp ancestry. That is a logical fallacy, right? Just because the grass is wet doesn't mean it rained. And we're going to keep going back to that, so keep that in mind. All humans have the same chromosome 2, or very similar chromosome 2, which supports that we all descended from a common ancestor, okay? Adam and Eve. 
There is disagreement, however, as to whether chromosome 2 is a result of a fusion event. People are still investigating this. Creationists are looking at this. Um, evolutionists are still looking at this. We don't really know for sure even if it's, fu if it's actual fusion of two chromosomes at some point in the past. So that's still kind of up for grabs on that. But again, we can say that this has nothing to do, it is a logical fallacy to think that this has anything to do with human chimp ancestry. All right, question three. And I might say, do shared ancient repetitive elements support common ancestry? Okay, what is an ancient repetitive element? Well, we're going to get to that. But this is, this is an interesting question. Uh, Michael Shermer, who is the head of the Skeptic Society, uh, president of that and publisher of Skeptic Magazine, actually came to the Creation Museum a few months ago back in March, and he interviewed me. And if you want to watch the interaction there, um, you can uh, Google it on, uh, or you can look at it for, on YouTube, and you'll find it there. It was an interesting exchange, but this was one of the questions that he asked me, and so I decided, wow, that's definitely going to be one of the ones that I put in my presentation, so I thank him for that. Um, the facts are, we do have repetitive elements. There's no doubt about that. And what are these repetitive elements? They, they compose 50% of our DNA is repetitive. Okay? It's the same kind of thing over and over again. 45% of those are, 45% of that's considered transposons, or what we call jumping genes. 3% uh, are repeats of less than 100 base pairs, so they're not very big, but certain segments that are repeated. And 5% are duplications of large segments of DNA. Uh, and again, uh, this is what we see, okay? This is a fact, okay? This is what we can actually observe in the human genome. But the question is, the real question is, though, how did it get there, okay? How did we get all of these repetitive elements? And that's where the word ancient comes in here, okay? Ancient repetitive elements and evolution. They're considered ancient because they find them in lower organisms. So you might see the same thing in a mouse, or you might see the same thing in a dog, or a bacteria, or whatever, and the same thing in us. So they say, well, because you see them in lower organisms, they're ancient. That's their philosophy on that. The other thing is, and this is really problematic, they say they're not functional. They are merely evolutionary leftovers from our ancient past, as we've evolved from one organism to another, and that Organisms that have a recent common ancestor, like humans and chimps, or even mice and humans, should have, a very, should have very similar ancient repetitive elements. Again, that whole idea of if they're similar, we must have a common ancestor. And so there's two issues we need to deal with here. First of all, are they or are they not functional? Because that's an important thing to talk about. And secondly, if they are, if they, if they are similar, does that imply common ancestry? So that's what we're going to look at. But first, the issue of functionality. And I'm going to share with you some quotes. And we're going to talk a lot about some quotes from um, The Language of God, which was written by Dr. Francis Collins, who is a theistic evolutionist. And we get a lot of questions about him recently. And so I wanted to share some information from his book so that we can better understand this. Um, he's just recently been appointed to head up the National Institutes of Health, and he played a major role in the Human Genome Project. So he's a very well-respected and well-known scientist, so a lot of people pay attention to what he says. Well, he said in this in his book, Mammalian genomes are littered with such AREs, with roughly 45% of the human genomes made up, of, made up of such genetic flotsam and jetsam. When I first read that, I thought, what is flotsam and jetsam? I'm not familiar with that. It has to do with kinds of debris in the ocean, uh, is what that is. So it's trash. Basically, notice he says they're littered, okay? So he's implying that they really don't have a function. But there's a problem with that because repetitive elements are actually functional. They do have a function, and there is a lot of evidence to support that, even evidence that was out at the time that he wrote this particular book. So I'm going to share with you a quote concerning that functionality of sequences in the human genome. It says, while less than 1.5% of the mammalian genome encodes proteins or is gene, it is now evident that the vast majority majority is transcribed mainly into non-protein coding RNA. So it's made from DNA into RNA, not into proteins. It just stays as RNA, doing something as RNA. This raises the question of what fraction of the genome is functional. Many of the observed non-coding transcripts or RNAs are differentially expressed. I mean, they're expressed differently in the brain than the liver. And while most have not yet been studied, increasing numbers are shown to be functional. Thus, it is likely that much more than 5% of the genome encodes functional information. And although the upper bound is unknown, it may be considerably higher than currently thought. And so it's not an evolutionary leftover, but rather it's very, very important. It's a functional part of our genome. And next, I want to share with you um, some research that was done by Dr. Richard Sternberg. Now, that name might sound familiar to you. Um, if you've seen the movie Expelled, he was one of the first scientists that was interviewed in that particular movie. And he's associated with the 
the intelligent design movement because he ran into some problems when he actually published of one of their papers in a journal that he looked at. And so what he decided to do was kind of have a compilation of all these repetitive elements and see, are they functional? Are they doing something? Drawing from the literature that's out there. And you know what? Now, I know you can't read this, and I don't expect you to, but he came up with repetitive element after repetitive element after repetitive element that has a known function. Table after table after table, okay? So uh, a lot of these elements do have a particular function, and he went on to say this. Our expectation is that one day we will think of what used to be called junk DNA, or these repetitive elements, as a critical component of truly expert cellular control regimes. I like that word, expert, okay? Intelligently designed by the creator God to do something in our genome. So even though Collins does not admit the functionality of AREs, he does think they're important, they're especially important when it comes to the issue of common ancestry. And he says this, when one aligns sections of the human and mouse genome anchored by the appearance of gene counterparts that occur in the same order, one can usually also identify AREs in approximately the same location in these two genomes. So he says, if you have gene A and gene B and you match them up, in between there's this ARE. Okay, this repetitive element. And you can see that over and over and over again. So he goes on to say, okay, he thinks this is really important. Of course, some might argue that these are actually functional elements placed there by the creator for a good reason. And our discounting of them as junk DNA just betrays our current level of ignorance. And indeed, some small fraction of them may play important regulatory roles. But certain examples severely strain the credulity of that explanation. Okay, so what he's saying is that, you know, he's, he goes on to then say basically that a lot of these repetitive elements are damaged, defunct, and decapitated. Okay, those are the three words that he likes to use. But does he really know that? Absolutely not. It is completely based on what we call a prejudicial conjecture that most of what is called junk DNA really is junk. Why does he think that? Because of his evolutionary starting point. This is what you would expect to see. There should be junk. There should be remnants of the past, and indeed that's what you see. And because it's a remnant of the past and we no longer need it, it's become damaged, defunct, and decapitated. Now, again, he doesn't actually know that. Okay? He's just conjecturing that. And again, even though we've only studied a minority of these elements, those tables showed you that they do have a function, and our knowledge is continuing to increase in there. They are indeed functional. Now, he goes on to say, after quite a little bit about talking about these damaged, okay, things in our genome, he goes on to say, unless one is willing to take the position that God has placed these decapitated AREs and these precise positions to confuse and mislead us, the conclusion of a common ancestor for humans and mice is virtually inescapable. This kind of recent genome data thus presents an overwhelming challenge to those who hold to the idea that all species were created ex nihilo. Wow, okay, that's a power-packed paragraph, and we're gonna take it apart piece by piece here. So the first part, he's basically saying, common ancestry or evolution is true simply because God wouldn't have done it that way, okay? He wouldn't have had these AREs in the same place, in the same genomes, in different organisms. He just wouldn't have done it that way. Okay, now, <laughs> again, he says, especially if they're damaged, there's no way. Now, how does he know what God would do? Now. I agree he wouldn't put damaged, you know, information in there um, in the same place, in the same organisms. He didn't do that. That's a result of the fall. If they are no longer functional, that's something that's happened as a result of the passage of time. But he's being completely arbitrary. How does he know? He doesn't. Obviously, it would never be to mislead or confuse us because God does not lie. He doesn't do that to us. But can't the divine creator God use similar parts in similar organisms? I mean, animals and man, especially mice and humans, I mean, we are both mammals, can he do that? Absolutely he can do that. He is a logical, orderly God, and that's what we would expect from him, and that's exactly what we see. So, going on now, he says, the conclusion of a common ancestor for humans and mice is virtually inescapable. See that term again, kind of like Ken Miller used? You know, there's no doubt about it. Uh, but once again, our friend, the logical fallacy. Okay, he's affirming the consequent. He's saying, if humans and mice share a common ancestor, then we should observe these shared AREs. Well, shared AREs are observed between humans and mice, therefore, humans and mice share a common ancestor. 
Again, just because the grass is wet doesn't mean it rain. And just because we share similar ARVs doesn't mean we have a common ancestor. Um, we need, and so there's, a, we have a common designer God who probably put them there for a very good reason. And we need to figure that out. We need to, we need to do that. And as creationists, you know what? We have a reason to do that because we believe that God designed it that way. But the evolutionists, they don't really have a reason to do it because after all, it's just an evolutionary leftover, right? Why bother? That's prohibiting science. Whereas we as creationists are progressing science because we see that as the result of God and we want to study it and we want to figure out what it's doing. Now, the very last argument he says here, he says this is an overwhelming challenge to those who hold to the idea that all species were created ex ex nihilo. I don't know of any creationist that believes that all species were created ex nihilo. Okay? This is very commonly heard. This is called a straw man argument. Okay? So he's going to basically set up an argument that we don't even use um, and then destroy it. <laughs> but we don't even use that argument. Um, so that's the problem with it. And this, this, doc, this scientist here says, hi, I'm a creationist. He's, you know, for the little puppet here, hi, I'm a creationist. I don't believe in science. Everybody knows science is real. What else don't you believe in? Well, creationists don't believe that animals change. Huh. But science shows us that animals do change. Absolutely. I totally agree that animals do change. I never said God created all species next to Hilo because his word doesn't say that. It says he created kinds ex nihilo. He created the different kinds, which we believe is about the family level of classification, not genus, not species, but family, okay? So again, that's the problem with that type of argument. He's setting up a straw man. So what can we say? Well, we can say that junk DNA is not junk, and we really need to rename that. <laughs> We've got to figure out a better term to use for that because it's just very problematic. Um, shared ARVs are not evidence for common ancestry. That is a logical fallacy, and those that argue who God wouldn't have done it that way are being completely arbitrary. And a common designer equals common designs. That's exactly what you would expect to see, and that's exactly what you do see. All right, now we go to question, I'm losing track here, four. Does gene duplication add new genes with new functions to the genome? Again, this is one we're seeing a lot of in increasing amount. Okay, the facts. Gene duplication is a duplication of a region of DNA that contains a gene. <laughs> I read that definition later, I thought, well, yeah, duh. <laughs> that kind of makes sense. Um, what you're doing is just taking a chunk of the DNA that has a gene and making and copying it. So now you have two copies instead of one copy, which is what you see in the picture here. You have two blue regions instead of one. Now, in, that's very harmful in animals and humans. In fact, it's been linked to several neurological disorders in humans, including Alzheimer's disease, um, Paget's disease of the bone, and an immunodeficiency disorder. So it's been linked to lots of problems, at least in animals and in humans. Um, and specifically, I talked about humans there. But it's very common in plants. They have a condition called polyploidy, where they actually duplicate entire sets of chromosomes, not just genes, but whole chromosomes. And it's very common, but it can be very beneficial in plants in specific environments. It may even result in speciation. It may help them adapt to the environment that they're in. So it's not to say that gene duplication or, or chromosome duplication doesn't occur. It does. But again, it's only really helpful in certain kinds of organisms. So how does this relate to evolution? Well, gene duplication is proposed as a major factor in generating new genes. This is how you get new stuff, right? You got to get new stuff. If you're going to go from a bacteria to human, like I say, you can't just tweak what's there. <laughs> you got to add stuff. You got to add information to get from one kind to another. And gene duplication provides the raw material for evolution. That's what mutation and natural selection will act on. They will act on that duplicated material. And, um, just to give you, again, some quotes on this, gene duplication is the primary source of new genes. This is how we get new stuff. This is how evolution is possible because of gene duplication. Evolutionary biologists agree that gene duplication has played an important role in the history of life on Earth, providing a supply of novel genes that make it possible for organisms to adapt to new environments. And this is how it works. The existence of diverse multi-gene families, particularly in eukaryotes, provides evidence that numerous events of gene duplication followed by functional diversification, we'll talk about that, have shaped genomes as we know them. So he says, what happens is you get a duplication. You've got one gene, now you get two genes. Now, mutation and natural selection act on this one. You get a brand new gene that does something new, but you still have the old one. Yay, okay, now we can go from, you know, bacteria to humans. That's at least the idea there. 
Um, over time, you're going to go from really small, simple genomes to really complex, big ones, like we have in, in human beings. And some evolutionists have even suggested that whole genome duplication, it's not even portions of the genome, but you duplicated the whole thing, and that's how you get these big jumps. Because like, how do you get to an invertebrate to a vertebrate? Okay, that's a big jump. And maybe that's what caused it. So how are they detecting these gene duplications? And how do they know this, okay? Because obviously this is something that happened in the past, right? They can't go back and look at it. I can't go back and look at it. Nobody can. Right? This is something in the past. So their presuppositions are going to play a big role in that. They mainly focus on gene families, as talked about here in the quote. So what is a gene family? Well, just like in a biological family, you know, I can, my sister and I look a lot alike, and we look a lot like our mom. So we can tell that we're a biological family. Um, related to one another. Well, the same is true for genes. They have families, too. Um, they have similar genes, that, similar genes have similar sequences and similar functions, okay? So they're called a gene family because they all do um, something very similar. Not exactly the same, but similar. And they claim that this is a result of an ancient gene duplication. So the biggest, the, probably the, the most used example of this is the human beta globin gene cluster. And you may have heard this before. This is a pretty common argument, um, again, used for this. And beta globin is combined with alpha globin to make hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is what carries oxygen in our blood, in our blood cells. So if you look at the beta globin gene cluster, there's actually um, five genes there, at least that we're going to talk about, that have a role in um, basically the development of an organism um, in developing their hemoglobin. So um, the gene epsilon, the epsilon globin, is formed when an individual is an embryo, okay, during the, uh, about six to eight weeks. Um, so then once, after that eight weeks is over with, basically, then the, or, then the human will switch to, the baby will switch to forming uh, gamma globin, okay? And that happens for the remainder of the pregnancy, so as they're a fetus. And then that gene gets turned off, and then delta and beta get turned on in the adult. Right after birth, those genes get turned on. So they all are combining with alpha globin, okay, to make hemoglobin, but there's different ones depending on the stage that the individual is at in life. And as one gene gets, as the next gene gets turned on, the previous gene gets turned off, okay? So it's sequential, it happens spatially and temporally. And in fact, they're all on the same chromosome, and the order that they are on the chromosome is the order that they turn on in the life of an individual, which is pretty amazing. Now, what they think happened about 200 million years ago, okay, even though no one was there to observe that, about 200 million years ago, you had one, human, you had one beta globin gene. Okay? So it duplicated, and you got two. And this one duplicated, and you got um, epsilon and gamma. And this one duplicated, and you got delta and beta. So lo and behold, you got the genes that you have today in the beta globin gene cluster. What's the problem with that? It's a logical fallacy, okay? <laughs> of affirming the consequent, okay? Once again, here we go. If gene families exist that share similar sequence and function, then gene duplication of a common ancestral gene must have occurred. Gene families exist that share similar sequence and function, therefore gene duplication of a common ancestral gene must have occurred. Right? Again, you don't know that. If the, even though the grass might be wet, it may not be because it rained. And even though we have these gene families where they have similar sequences and similar function, doesn't mean it's a result of an ancestral duplication. Something that's interesting about these gene families is, especially beta globin gene, they all have slightly different functions. They don't have the same function, slightly different function, but they're all doing the, basically the same thing, though, right? So, so again, it's very important to remember that. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. And also, here's what gets me about this. I don't understand. How do similar genes with similar functions get you, progress you from going from molecules to man? Don't you need different genes with different functions? I mean, I thought that was the whole point, right? So how does having something similar get you to become a human being? I mean, th that's very, I just went off the top of my head. That one really, I don't understand. How gene families are really good proof of this, or really good evidence for this. And there's a lot of problems with this. Duplicated genes are actually often silent. So even if this did occur in the past, um, that other gene would probably be quieted down because it's considered a defect a lot of times. Uh, again, in humans, it can lead to a lot of problems. There's a lot of ways to silence those duplicated genes. Gene duplication, is, it turns out, is not a common event. Now, uh, they did some studies on this, and this comes from the secular scientists. They say there are, they, they are estimating that there is 0.01, right, 0.01 duplications per gene per million years. Right. That's, <laughs> now, 
And I quote, this is what they said in the paper, and I quote, the origin of a new function appears to be a very rare fate for a duplicate gene, end quote. But yet, that's how we supposedly got all these novel genes. But it's very rare, okay? It doesn't work. Even if you give it more time, if it's a very rare event, it's still not going to get you to where you need to be. Some genes are actually needed in multiple copies. You need that. So it looks as if it was designed, not evolved, because you need those. Um, ribosomal RNA genes, for example, are a really good um, example of that. You need those for the rapid production of ribosomes to get those proteins made. Um, and if you just delete one or two copies from bacteria, from humans, from flies, they don't do so well. Okay? They need all their copies. So what did, they, what did they happen in the meantime? They had to wait for these duplication events to occur so they could survive. I mean, that's a clear problem for evolution, okay? You can't wait around to get all these duplication events so the organism can survive. Uh, gene families have very complex interactions, as I told you with beta globin. You know, all of those different globins that are there have different affinities for oxygen, and they're important depending on the developmental status of the individual, okay? Whether they're an embryonic, embryo or a fetus or, you know, an adult. It varies, and so you need them all, okay? You can't, again, wait around for these duplications to occur because they're needed at different time points throughout the life of an organism. And mutations are degenerative, and we're going to talk more about that in a minute. Um, they don't add information. They don't um, lead to something that's getting better and better. It's something that's getting worse and worse. So that's a problem in and of itself. So what can we say? Gene families are not evidence of past gene duplication events. Again, that's a logical fallacy to say that. Uh, gene families have complex interactions. We simply can't wait around, okay? Organism can't wait around for duplication events to occur. We need them all there at one time. So it really contradicts their gradual formation via evolution. And gene duplication cannot result in the production of new genes with new functions because it's dependent on mutation. And as we've said before, mutation leads to a loss of genetic information, not a gain of genetic information. So it's not going to help you. Even if you have this raw material for evolution to work on, or mutation and natural selection to work on, it doesn't work. Okay? It's not going to get you something new and improved, shall we say. So that's what we can say about gene duplications. Now, what about beneficial mutations? This is another really, really popular one. And again, we just got done talking about mutations and what they can and cannot do. So let's focus on that a little bit more. Do they add information to the genome? Because that's absolutely required if you're going to go from molecules to man. The facts. Beneficial mutations do not exist. Now, before you all go, oh, okay, what is she saying? Right? The reason I'm saying that is because it's really not the proper way to say that. Beneficial mutations do not exist. However, beneficial outcomes of mutations in specific environments do exist. Okay? It really depends on the context whether or not a mutation is a good or a bad thing. The most primo example of that is antibiotic resistance in bacteria. When there are antibiotics around, that mutation is a good thing. It helps it resist the antibiotic. If you move it into an environment without antibiotics, guess what? It becomes a bad thing. Okay? It cannot compete as well. It's not as fit, so it does worse. So it depends on the environment whether or not a mutation is a good or a bad thing. So there are beneficial outcomes, but not beneficial mutations. I right? hope everybody's clear on that. Mutations only alter current genetic information. They have never ever been observed to add genetic information. They can only change what is there. Right? Now keep that in mind. I have a lot of papers come across my desk of supposedly mutations that have added genetic information. And I've read them all, and I've looked at them all, and never once have I seen one that has added genetic information. They just don't do that. Instead, they decrease genetic information. They take away from it. Now, that's not to say that can't be a good thing. In a specific environment, it can be, like I talked about with antibiotic resistance. But overall, you're degenerating, OK? We're all a bunch of mutants. <laughs> um, we're all degenerating slowly over time. Uh, so that's what's happening. Mutations lead to the decrease in the overall fitness of the organism. May be beneficial in this environment, but not so much over here. And so uh, slow degeneration occurs. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at some of the best and most used and abused examples um, that have been presented for beneficial mutations adding information to the genome and thus providing a mechanism for molecules to man evolution. Nylon and nylon-degrading bacteria. How many have heard of this? 
Okay, yeah, quite a few. That is a very, very, very common example that you'll see out there uh, of a beneficial mutation that's added information. So nylon-6, so what's happening here? Well, nylon-6 is, is a synthetic polymer that was first produced in 1935. Many of us women are very familiar with this because this is hose okay, um, that we wear, so that's an important component there of that. And Arthrobacter was found to actually digest the byproducts of nylon-6 manufacture. It was actually breaking down um, what, was what was left over, so to speak, after they produced the nylon. And since nylon is a man-made product that was only first produced in 1935, then the bacteria could have only recently gained the ability to break down the um, nylon. So how did they do this? How did they gain the ability to degrade nylon? I mean, that seems pretty unique, right? Pretty new. Um, the beneficial mutations add information to make these nylon degrading enzymes. I mean, they didn't have the enzymes to do it, and now they did. I mean, wow, if that's true, then that would be a pretty airtight case to say that mutations can add information. But let's look at this, because they've tried to figure out how they do this. There are three enzymes that are involved in the degradation of nylon, E1, E2, and E3. Okay? Those three enzymes are absolutely needed. Now, E1 and E3 alter the nylon. Um, they change it so E2 can actually break it down. Now, most of the focus has been on E2, and in fact, they don't even have a mutational analysis yet done for E1 and E3, because people consider E2 more important, because it actually does the degrading part. Um, E1 and E3 probably have alterations in them as well, but we just don't know about that yet. So we want to take a look at E2, because that's the one people focus on, and that's what you'll see out there um, when you read about this. E2 is a carboxyesterase, I mean, kind of a big word, but we won't get into all that. It breaks down carboxyesters, that's its role. Well, they found it had point mutations, single base changes in it that change the active side of the enzyme. An enzyme is a protein that breaks other things down. And so basically, these carboxyesters will come in to this active site and they will alter them and change them and then they leave. Okay, well now this active site's been altered. So not only can it degrade carboxyesters, but it can degrade nylon as well. So it can do that. So it still maintains its original function and it degrades nylon. But what has happened? We've had a reduction of the enzyme specificity. We've lost something. It used to be really specific, right? It used to be specific for discarboxyesters. Now we've reduced its specificity and it can do both nylon and carboxyesters. So you've lost something. You haven't gained, yeah, you've gained the ability to, to break down nylon, but you've also lost the specificity of the enzyme. And this is just a diagram kind of showing you this. Um, before the point mutations, the carboxyesters will come in, but the nylon can't, okay? They can't, it can't fit in the active site. After the point mutation, both the carboxyesters and the nylon can come in and be modified by this particular enzyme. And uh, Dr. Kevin Anderson, who's with the Creation Research Society, and myself uh, wrote a paper on this for the last um, uh, international conference on creationism last year. And uh, we had this to say about, these, about this particular um, example. Nonetheless, reduced specificity of a pre-existing enzyme is biochemically degenerative to the enzyme, reducing the specificity, even if it provides a presumed phenotypic benefit. The beneficial phenotype of nylon degradation requires the a priori existence of the enzyme and its specificity. You've already got to have the enzyme there. You're not making anything new. You're changing what's already there. Its degeneration is not a mechanism that accounts for the origin of either the enzyme or its specificity, right? It's not something that gave you new enzymes. It took enzymes that were already there and altered them, which is exactly what mutations do. Sometimes it's beneficial, and in this case it is. And we'll talk about more examples of that on Thursday. That happen a lot. It's very common in bacteria. But again, it's not adding information. It's altering what's currently there. Now, there's a lot of information out there on the web about nylon degrading bacteria. Be careful what you read. A lot of it is not current. It's not based on information that was published in 2007 on this. So um, anything that's prior to that, please be wary of that because I found a lot of problems um, with things that are out there. But it really shows the amazing adaptability of bacteria that they can do this. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about bacteria on Thursday. Okay, another famous one you hear about is Richard Linsky and his work with E. coli. Richard Linsky is a molecular ecologist at Michigan State University. And he has done some work with the little E. coli bacteria that inhabit our gut. Um, he's cultured 12 lines of E. coli beginning in 1988. 
Okay? Now that's a long time ago. Um, and he's had over 44,000 generations of bacteria that have been generated in his lab as a result of that. And some pretty interesting things have come out of that. And every so once in a while he publishes a paper. And this is what um, Jerry Coyne, who is an anti-creationist, pro-evolutionist, very much so, had this to say. Linsky's experiment is also yet another poke in the eye for anti-evolutionists, notes Jerry Coyne, an evolutionary biologist at the University of Chicago. The thing I like most is it says you can get these complex traits evolving by a combination of unlikely events, he says. That's just what creationists say can't happen. Now, are complex traits evolving by a combination of unlikely events? Well, let's take a look at what Linsky found, because you can read his papers and you can see what he indeed discovered. Well, the fitness of the bacteria that are in the lab now are, is greater than that of the parental strain. The, the, the parent bacteria that he started out with, the bacteria has now, are more fit. <laughs> Imagine that. They've adapted to life in the lab. Okay? They like it there. Um, but you know what? How have they adapted to life in the lab? They've lost stuff. Okay? That doesn't help you. That doesn't add information. They've lost the ability to degrade certain sugars. They've lost the ability to move. They've lost their flagella genes. And they've lost certain regulatory controls. Hmm. Of course they have. Why should they bother being able to degrade multiple kinds of um, sugars when they only have one kind they're ever being fed? Why should they bother to move? And they don't have to move. Food comes to them. Okay? They don't need these things, so they throw them out. There's no point in making them if they never need them. So um, they've adapted to the lab conditions. That's great. They're more fit in the lab. But try putting them in the soil and see what happens. <laughs> they die, OK? They don't do very well. They cannot compete with the regular, normal E. coli that's out there. There's a trade-off. Uh, they're more fit for one environment, but less fit for another, as we already said. So this isn't a poke in, our, in the eye, in our eye, but a feather in our cap, right? It's exactly what we'd expect to see, and that's exactly what we do see. They should adapt. And Kevin Anderson and I had this to say, the beneficial mutations, according, dealing with Linsky's work, the beneficial mutations are very environmentally specific, and a change in this environment often negates the benefit of a mutation. When repeatedly cultivated in a constant environment, it is not surprising that an organism would reduce its genome of some unused genes and functions. Why bother with those things? In other words, such a reduction can be beneficially selected only as long as the organism remains in that constant environment. Ultimately, the genetic effect of these mutations is a loss of function useful for one type of environment as a trade-off for adaptation to a different environment. Okay? So yeah, it's great for over here, but not so great over here. Okay? It's trading off, so to speak. So evolution, it's not evolution. It's not a gain of information. You didn't gain any structures, and you didn't gain any functional systems. It's adaptation. You're losing functional systems. You're losing information. You're losing structures. But it's very specific in relationship to the environment. And if you want to read more about this, this paper is located on the Answers in Genesis website. So if you Google, or if you put in our search engine, probably protom and uh, beneficial mutations or something like that, um, you'll get this paper will come up and you can read that for more information. So what can we say? Well, some mutations do provide beneficial outcomes in certain environments. That's absolutely true. But mutations have never been observed to add information. We're looking at the best of the best, okay? This is the best, and it's not doing it. Only decrease information, never add to it. So, a trade-off occurs as organisms adapt to an environment. Yes, they're better here, but not so well over here. But the overall fitness is decreasing. They're being very, um, becoming very specific for a certain environment. Beneficial mutations, therefore, cannot be a mechanism for evolution because that requires a gain of information. And as we've seen, even with our best examples, they're leading to a loss of information. So again, starting with God's truth makes sense of what we observe in genetics as it applies to the present and the past, and that what we observe in genetics confirms the truthfulness of God's word. But starting with man's ideas as the truth, again, leads to a lot of problems that we've seen, a lot of conflicts, a lot of logical fallacies concerning what we observe in genetics and how it applies to the present and the past, and it does not confirm man's idea as truth. Let's go back to 1 Peter 3.15 here. I shared this with you earlier. We have to be prepared to give an answer. And yes, it's to help people understand their need for Christ and to come to know Christ. But you know what else? I like verse 16 too. Keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. May we be able to answer questions that people have about genetics, geology, astronomy, I don't care what it is, so that we can lead people to Christ so that they will be ashamed of their slander and they will be led to the knowledge and the truthfulness of God's word. May we all be able to do that.